There are certain internet rivalries that cut deep. DC vs. Marvel. Vin Diesel vs. The Rock. Star Wars fans vs. other Star Wars fans. Then there's the rivalry that will never end. The one that has lasted since the early 2000s and will likely continue until the end of time. Xbox vs. PlayStation. That being said, in 2018, a small olive branch in this bitter, bitter conflict was offered. On a little game you may have heard of, Fortnite. An olive branch called cross-platform play. So, once upon a time, games were just built for the single-player experience. The developer would give you a nice plumber to jump through a world, or a super soldier who wanted to shoot through a planet filled with space demons. Weirdly enough, that still describes games that are coming out now. The difference is that this type of experience is no longer the only way to play. In fact, games like The Avengers make it seem like publishers are desperate to be done with that whole single-player experience altogether. That's because no matter how difficult a boss you can make, it will never compare to another human character. Sorry, From Software. Try as you might to make as many Dark Souls as you want, but man will always be the most dangerous game. More importantly, online play will always be the most profitable game. You see, no matter how much money could be made in offering new story content for your favorite RPG, it will never compare to the thrill of spending a ton of money on upgrades or loot for weapons you could use to take down another player. This entire business model started off on surprisingly shaky ground. The original Wolfenstein and Doom started the craze with computer-based online competitions. Then things took off with id Software's Quake World, which put in serious commitment to its online play. The game became a sport with players obsessive over every inch of the map. This addictive new gameplay feature took off and became a true sensation, which led to more titles like Half-Life and Unreal Tournament, which blazed new trails for the online gaming genre. Things finally got to consoles with the Sega Dreamcast, which was the first to offer this functionality. Unfortunately, it was a bit ahead of its time. Internet functionality and availability wasn't able to catch up to the rising demand to play against your friends from the comfort of home. So Sega's big launch into new territory did little more than pave the way for Sony and Microsoft to own the market with their never-ending war for online dominance. Don't feel too bad for Sega, though. They had the chance to get in with both companies and turn them down. I mean, I never thought Sonic the Hedgehog looked like a great businessman. So now that the functionality was out there, everyone would be able to play together pretty soon, right? Wrong. Technology may be one thing, but business rivalries are a whole other problem. By the time the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 arrived, that whole internet fad had really taken off. Many households now had high-speed internet that could support online play. So both devices were equipped with online functionality, social media services, and most importantly, an online store with your credit card one click of a button away. So with all this interconnectivity, why couldn't these two titans just play nice and let us all play together? Well, one answer has more than a little to do with a game called Halo. You see, Microsoft wisely spent a ton of money acquiring this property that could serve as the face of Xbox. This ended up becoming the choice that launched the Xbox into legend status. Sure, the single player campaign with Master Chief was fun and all, but this game was all about the multiplayer. While many still enjoyed getting friends together with that split screen over beer and pizza life, the real game was in the inevitable online explosion. Halo was a first person shooting online playing sensation. Not only that, but you couldn't play it on a PlayStation. All those Covenant monsters might as well have had the Sony logo plastered on their faces. Luckily, that was far from the only sensation in town. The Call of Duty Modern Warfare franchise has become such a big game for online play that it's probably the first franchise many longtime players think of when asked about online gaming. The fast-paced battle of Rageaholics is as much an art form as it is a video game at this point. The brutal showdowns between fans of the series was remarkably like the one had by its two main distributors. Instead of kill counts to track, Sony and Microsoft had daily active users. The thinking there was that if you wanted to play with your friends, then that would be a selling point to get you to buy a PlayStation or an Xbox. The more daily active users each had signing on to shoot and dismember their buddies, the stronger the chances were of more of their buddies buying a console to join in on the carnage. That is a very modern style of warfare indeed. That method of business continued on and on, with the new titles releasing every year to try and tip the scales toward or away from the other. 
This heavy competition was the center of the generation, as fans passionately defended PlayStation or Xbox's superiority. Funnily enough, all of this effort over online play, exclusives, and super gritty games lost out to Nintendo's silly Wii console that allow grandparents to bowl with their grandkids in the living room. Literally no one thought freaking Wii Sports would be such a huge deal. That's the funny thing that happens when you sell games though. You never know which surefire hits are gonna flop, and which flops are gonna hit harder than you could have ever imagined. Luckily, it seems as if the competition has changed a bit during the current generation. The idea of Xbox and PlayStation players actually being able to go head-to-head -head was once a fever dream. Then, it wasn't. On the subject of how no one knows what games are going to hit or not, let's talk about PUBG. If you were gonna gamble on what Battle Royale franchise would define a generation, it would have seemed like PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds was the one to bet on. I imagine not a day goes by someone who worked on PUBG doesn't look in the mirror and ask, how in the world did we lose to Fortnite? By all accounts, Fortnite looks like one of those games that would be a 99 cent app store shooter literally no one plays. Objectively, it has none of the things that the big shooters before it had. It doesn't have the gritty, war-torn tone of Call of Duty, the sci-fi spectacle of Halo, or the cynical humor of Borderlands. With its cheap, cartoony graphics and somewhat simple world, Fortnite barely even seems like a contender. Like Wii Sports before it though, there's something Fortnite has that rakes in the most players. Crossover appeal. Young Gen Z players love Fortnite. Millennials love Fortnite. Even Jack Black loves Fortnite. It has become such a sensation that players are literally paying people to train their kids on the game, or to even teach them the dances. Its crossover appeal doesn't just stretch to different generations of gamers though, but also to different ways to game. Case in point, if you took out your phone right now and downloaded Fortnite, I bet you could be in a game before the end of this video. Seriously, race me, and I bet you could win. In a world where every new Call of Duty game almost needs a second PS4 to store the game you're playing on, the first PS4, this is insane. So, it's fitting that Fortnite would be the one to bring Sony and Microsoft together. As of 2018, Sony finally caved on cross-platform play for Fortnite. This was a huge shift for gaming that could affect the future of the PS5 and Xbox Series X generation. The idea that we could all be able to enjoy Call of Duty or get disappointed by whatever EA throws at us together was at one point insane. As much as this could be good for giant titles, it's likely even better for growing the player base of smaller titles. At the end of the day, gamers often flock to small games like Rocket League, Among Us, and Fall Guys. Games like these depend on growing their player numbers quickly across multiple platforms. The more platforms people can play these titles with their friends, the more games like these we will see thrive. What we truly want are gaming experiences that are new and special. Ones that push the gaming industry in weird ways that aren't necessarily decided by a boardroom meeting. And more than anything else, we want to play these games together. There you have it, how cross-platform gaming finally became a thing. If you have any thoughts on the future of gaming or what videos you want to see next, Drop us a comment and don't forget to like and subscribe for more from The Gamer.